There's also a lot of lifestyle factors that influence whether or not somebody might burn. It's not just simply, you know, that you're pale. It's like, what else are you doing in your life that is increasing your susceptibility to burning, whether it's related to your diet, your light exposure habits, your eating timing, um, whether it's related to your use of sunglasses and UV blocking contacts and lenses that's preventing that light from getting into the eye. There's lots of different factors that can influence how susceptible you are for burning. And maybe, you know, we could talk about those a little bit if you want. Yeah, let's go into them. You mentioned diet. Let's start there. Yeah. So one of the major ones is the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. So omega-3 fats are highly anti-inflammatory and supportive to the body. Omega-6 fats are also essential fatty acids, but we're basically overdosing on them in the modern environment. So if you look at the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 in the ancestral diet compared to today, we're looking at like a two or four to one ratio of six to three in the past and around a 20 to one ratio today. So we're eating way more sixes than we ever have before. And that's primarily from hyper palatable processed foods that use industrially produced seed oils to, um, you know, fry and cook them in. Um, so that would include things like soy, corn, sunflower, safflower um, oils uh, that are highly enriched in omega-6 fats, which... Um, there's an added issue with the omega-6s, which are also a type of polyunsaturated fat, a PUFA. So are the omega-3s. But PUFAs are very fragile because they have multiple double bonds. Um, they have points where they're susceptible to oxidation, essentially, and getting rancid. And so most industrial seed oils, to my knowledge, are deodorized to prevent you from detecting whether or not they're actually rancid with your nose because, you know, typically if something was rancid, you would know it immediately. You wouldn't want to eat it. And so there's like all of these hoops that the companies jump through to make this product seem palatable when it's actually very poisonous. Um, and the fats that you're eating in your diet are directly influencing your skin cell membranes um, because the skin turns over roughly every eight days, I believe. Um, and so the fat in your diet is influencing the fats that end up in those skin cell membranes. So if you have these fragile oxidized PUFAs in your membranes, compared to something like an animal-based saturated fat, for example, which has no double bonds and has this nice straight structure that allows it to stack on top of each other nicely, the PUFAs have these large kinks in the structure that prevent them from sitting nicely. So if you have cell membranes that are chock full of these omega-6s that are also oxidized on top of that, they're reactive, they're inflamed, they're creating, they're changing the membrane fluidity of skin cells to make the skin cells more fragile. Um, and so you're going to have already like a low grade chronic inflammation in the skin potentially, which makes your skin more susceptible to burning when you're exposed to UV light. Um, that's coupled with the fact that people are highly deficient in omega threes. So the omega threes are highly anti-inflammatory, like I mentioned, especially omega three DHA. Most people aren't getting virtually any EPA or DHA in the diet. Uh, most people are only getting alpha linoleic acid or ALA, which is the plant-based form of omega-3s. Uh, the conversion of ALA to EPA is between 5 and 10%, and the conversion of ALA to DHA is between 0.5 and 4%. And so it's feasibly, you know, impossible to make enough DHA from getting ALA alone. You need to get EPA and DHA from animal-based sources, so that would be Shellfish, caviar, fatty fish, um, lamb is one land animal that's highest in DHA as well. Um, and so a lot of people aren't necessarily eating foods like this to get those animal-based omega-3s in. And some people, if they're like vegetarian and not eating seafood or they're vegan, relying on algal oils, there's another added issue here as well because just to get a little technical briefly, if you look at the structure of the fats in algal oil and in animal-based sources of, of omega-3s, they're primarily triglycerides. The one exception is caviar, which is primarily the phospholipid form of omega-3s, which is actually the most bioavailable to the brain and the eyes. The retina is about 35, sorry, about 65% by weight DHA, and the brain is about 35% by weight DHA. So these tissues rely on DHA in order to function. And there's a researcher called Dr. Michael Crawford who actually works, um, he's like a major DHA researcher, and he has shown that DHA actually works at the quantum biologic level to convert photonic or light information into electrical impulses, which allows you to render reality from moment to moment. So the DHA in your eyes and your brain is actually what is allowing you to have an experience of the world. Um, so it's very, very important. 
But if we're looking at the triglyceride form in algal oil or in, in fish or shellfish, triglycerides are made of a glycerol backbone, which has three carbons. And at each carbon you can have, well, technically at each oxygen that's bound to each carbon, you can have a fatty acid. So there's three fatty acids on the glycerol backbone. Um, the first one is SN1, middle one is SN2, the last one is SN3. So in algal oil, you have primarily SN1 and SN3, EPA and DHA. In fatty fish and shellfish, you primarily have the SN2 position. It turns out that the SN2 position is highly more bioavailable for humans than the SN1 and SN3 positions. So if you're looking to optimize your EPA and DHA status, it is very prudent to get animal-based sources of these fats um, as they're just going to, you know, be a better bang for your buck and also support your biology better. Of course, there's lots of other nutrients that come along for the ride um, when it comes to um, the shellfish and the fatty fish like mackerel, sardines, herring, um, salmon, uh, ideally wild caught whenever you can. Um, of course, the diet of the fish in question will greatly influence the fat composition. So if you're eating farmed salmon, you're not really going to be getting any omega-3s because those salmon are fed corn, which is enriched in omega-6s. Um, what allows the fish that you're eating for omega-3s to actually get that EPA and DHA is either they're consuming algae or they're consuming another animal that consumed algae. The algae is ultimately the, the initial source of the omegas, but by consuming them, these other animals can convert them into the more bioavailable form that supports our bodies better. So on the dietary standpoint, that's one of the major ones. I would say this omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. Um, but there's also a, an issue of timing as well. So there's some research to suggest that if you eat late at night, you're more susceptible to burning the next day. And that's because the gut, the skin, and the lungs are all very inextricably linked. They're all barrier surfaces. Um, and so it turns out when you eat late at night, it messes with your gut clocks that are trying to determine what time of day it is depending on when you're eating. So if you're eating a meal and it's, you know, nighttime, it's let's say, I don't know, 10 p.m. or something like this, you're telling your gut that it's daytime actually. And that's informing your skin that, oh crap, it's actually daytime, not nighttime. So we got to change some things around. And now when it's actually daytime, your skin is like, I don't know what time it is anymore. So like, now it's not able to mount the melanation response in the same way and, and support um, the, the assimilation of that photonic energy as well compared to somebody who has a more circadian way of eating, which would be a larger breakfast meal. You can maybe even skip lunch if you wanted and then having a smaller, more keto or carnivore dinner, um, which would allow you to get into a good fat burning state overnight so that when you wake up around sunrise, you're combining low-grade ketosis with red and infrared light from the sun, in particular ratio with blue, which optimizes mitophagy, autophagy, and uh, cellular turnover. Also helps to repair all the heme proteins in the body, including hemoglobin, including the protein complexes that are involved in that electron transport chain within the mitochondria, um, as well as setting that circadian clock in the brain, that master clock. Um, so the timing of your food is also important in this context. Um, to help prevent burning. And I mean, outside of that, I guess the one other thing that I would mention is like just your glycemic response to meals, because if you're consistently getting hyperglycemic after meals and it takes a while to clear that glucose, that's both kind of a sign and symptom of mitochondrial dysfunction. So like it can both exacerbate inflammation and make issues worse, but it can also, it's basically a sign that there's already an underlying issue present at the level of like insulin resistance, for example which is typically preceded by leptin resistance as well. So they tend to go together. Um, so maintaining like more stable glycemia levels are um, imperative and I would say supportive if you're looking to maintain a lower inflammatory state. And the lower our baseline of inflammation is, the less likely we're gonna be to burn as well. So I think those are probably the main diet pieces. Um, with regards to the light environment pieces, if we're looking at um, the light coming into the eyes. Again, I told you guys earlier that when you get UV light into the eye, it stimulates POMC production in the brain. That makes alpha MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone, but also beta and gamma MSH as well. This trio helps to stimulate melanocytes to make new melanin. So if you want to get a tan in response to the sun and not a burn, it's important that we're getting that coordinated production of the MSHs in both the brain and in the skin 
in order to maximize that melanation response. Um, if you're blocking half of that equation, you know, then you're going to be basically missing half of the response. Um, and so, you know, I would say there's, uh, there, there's typically pushback from the more centralized zealots out there about, oh, like there's no evidence that sunglasses block your, or like imp increase your susceptibility to burning. But mechanistically from a first principle standpoint, it's very there. It's just that like people don't study these types of questions because the sun is just demonized point blank. There's no nuance to be had there. Despite the fact that if you look at the risk benefit of sun exposure, even within the centralized literature, you'll see in certain cases, which, which I would argue are completely preventable with regards to squamous cell, basal cell, and melanoma. Um, actually, there's some evidence to suggest that melanoma is not caused by skin or by sun exposure at all, but that basal cell and squamous cell, there may be a small contribution, but that if somebody's building out their solar callus, you know, this may not be an issue whatsoever. We don't have enough nuance in that published data to say that, but that's my hypothesis and what I would also plan to study within the light lab in the future. Um, but when it comes to, you know, the risk side of the equation, there's always this, you know, sighting of, of skin cancer or eye damage. Meanwhile, if you actually look at the big picture of the literature, we see, okay, there may be a small increased risk of basal cell carcinoma, but if you look at the benefit side of the equation, we have protection against cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, multiple cancer types, including melanoma, but also including breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, and blood cancers. We also have protection against neurodegeneration and autoimmune diseases. So if we look at the total burden on our healthcare system, clearly the, the risk benefit is much weighted towards the benefit of getting more sun exposure and not the risks, given that the benefits are supporting the amelioration or the prevention of diseases that are the biggest burdens on our healthcare system. Um, and so I just think that the lack of nuance in that conversation is always, it's always a big red flag to me when we see anything just demonized point blank and there's no sort of consideration for, um, you know, more context to the conversation. And then of course, there's also just a complete lack of like contextualization for people of different races. So like, to the point where there's literally a brand of sunscreen on the market called black girl sunscreen. And I'm just like pulling my hair out because there's, you know, sunscreen is the last thing somebody with dark skin needs, especially if you live in America, because essentially anybody with more melanated skin that lives in America is at too North of a latitude for their biology. Like we should be at more Southern latitudes because our skin is expecting to receive that full spectrum light. That's the point of that melanin. And like some in the centralized sphere would argue, okay, melanin is there to protect against UV light. But I would actually make the argument that the melanin is there to harness the high photonic energy of the UV light productively. And that is kind of in alignment with the work of Dr. Arturo Solis Herrera, who has coined this term human photosynthesis, whereby melanin can be used to make free energy in the body via sunlight stimulating that melanin. And that has already been proven unequivocally within a different model system um, of mushrooms. So there were mushrooms found in Chernobyl in the 90s that were like dark, dark black in color. And the research team found out that these mushrooms were actually using melanin to make free energy from the gamma radiation from the nuclear fallout in the environment. So we already know this is possible within mushrooms, which are actually more closely related to um, animals than they are to plants. So we just basically need to, you know, get a little bit more funding for this research. There's not that much available within the centralized model, but that's why I'm also going to build out this light lab, which is going to be fully privately funded and decentralized um, so that we don't have these same hurdles of like getting funding from the three letter agencies to ask important questions that are not prioritized by the, you know, powers that be that are embedded within this uh, pharmaceutical medical industrial complex. And there's no incentive to really, ask these questions and prevent people from getting diseases that are being financially um, leveraged in some way. So anyway, I forgot what I was initially talking about. I think sunburn. Sunburn and different foods that can, in yeah. ways of eating that can impact that. There's a couple other things I'll mention before I'll hand the mic back. So the other thing I already mentioned was blue light exposure because it directly impairs mitochondrial function in the skin and on your surfaces in general. Um, mitochondria are required to make m new melanin. And so if you're impairing the mitochondria, that's going to impair your ability to make new melanin in response to UVB light. In addition, non-native EMFs similarly also directly impair mitochondrial function 
on the surfaces, the skin, eyes, and proximal brain regions. And so that is also going to impair the melanation response to UVB light. Um, and I think those are kind of the main ones that I'm thinking about right now. Something else will probably come to me, but I'm sure you have questions. <laughs> If you enjoyed that clip, you're going to want to head over here and catch the full episode. I'll see you over there. UV light produces this complex pro-hormone in the body called pro-opiomelanocortin or POMC. POMC is cleaved into 10 different hormonal products, one of which is beta-endorphin, which is a natural opioid that the body makes in response to UV.